before we enter into the scriptures, you know, I just want to talk to you a little bit about. Did you want to say something? Okay. Um, about the gospel, you know, that we preach, that we teach, and you know about the person of God. You know, as I've as I've walked with God through the years. And I've come to realize that, you know, we can't figure everything out. We don't, we don't have the answer to everything. I don't care how long you've been walking with God. I don't care how much you study the Word of God. How many teachers you sit under. You know, I don't care how much you pray. There is a mystery. There is an element of mystery to the gospel. There's an element of mystery to the person of God. You know, the Bible said it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Then they say that over there in the book of Proverbs. But it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. You know, it's what it's what we what we place value on in our lives. What do you value? You know, to not value something in the, in, the, in the biblical sense means to treat it lightly, to treat it of little worth. We get our word despise. How many of you ever, I mean, I go to Pensacola every once in a while to visit my daughter and grandkids and stuff. And, uh, well, I have two daughters down there now. But, you know, under every bridge just about... There are people that are less fortunate, that are living in tents, that are washing windows, that are bumming. You know what I'm saying? And when you when you see that type of person, maybe a street person, what do you think about that person? Do you, do you think less of that person? Because I'm going to tell you that's the natural inclination of the human heart apart from God is to think less of that person because of their condition, because of their situation, maybe because of their choices, maybe things out of their control, that they are in a bad spot. And if we're not careful, we, we place an estimation on that. We place a value on that, like that person is less valuable because their circumstances are not as good as yours. I mean, I know, I know the human heart when you see somebody like that, you know, and, and, and when it comes to the things of God, you know, unless we recognize them, unless we were trained and we learn to hear from God and learn to estimate things according to the way he values them, you know, we won't treat them like they're important, like they're treasures. You know, the mystery, you know, Paul talks about the mystery of the gospel. You know, great is the mystery. A mystery is, what, what do, do, do any of you like mysteries on TV? Ellen does. <laughs> you know, I, I like mysteries. I, I like something that I, I, I have to watch and, and I have to figure it out. You know, but a lot of times it takes me totally by surprise. Now, some of them are pretty obvious which way they're going. But I had, I, I had one movie, I'm not going to mention the name of it, that I watched, and I was totally shocked at the, at the end of the movie how it unfolded. You know? And that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to search out the mystery. I mean, it's a mystery revealed. It is. You know, in the Old Testament, it was a mystery concealed. We, we didn't see clearly. It was like a dimly lit room. And even the people that were prophesying didn't have an understanding of what they were saying. They only knew by the Spirit that it was not for them, it was for us. But we have to care. We have to place importance on seeking out and searching out the mystery. You know, even the, the apostles and those that, that were there when Jesus was crucified, 
they did not understand what was taking place. To them, it was a tragedy. To them, it was defeat. And even after he rose from the dead, they still didn't understand the scriptures. And even after the day of Pentecost and, and the outpouring of the Spirit, and like Sister Francis was teaching on Wednesday night, even in Acts 10, they still didn't understand what God had done at the cross and at the resurrection from the dead and the exaltation. They still didn't understand it. And it had been 10 years that they had been preaching and teaching and walking in the things of God, but yet they still didn't understand the mystery. And then God saved a man named Saul. And he became Paul. And God took him on the backside of the desert and taught him the revelation of Jesus Christ, which was totally contrary to everything that he had been taught. Paul had to unlearn. Mm. He had to unlearn. How many of you have had to unlearn some things? <laughs> Boy, I have been taught wrong. And it is nobody's fault, per se, because they didn't know any more than I didn't know. And I went to Bible school, and one of the most prominent Bible teachers at the time, and he was wrong about some things. But he was right about some things. So we've got to be open to be taught. To, to hear the voice of God, be open to the things of God. You know, I, 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 I think about things <clears throat> of conscience. You know, we have to be careful with people, in dealing with people. And, 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 you know, we have to be careful that we don't impose on people the things that maybe God has revealed to you but you're not, they're not ready to walk in that yet. I'm just going to use Sister Frances as an example because I know she is strong and she wouldn't take anything I say, you know, as a derogatory statement because Sister Frances will tell you herself. <clears throat> when she first came to Natchitoches, and I think I've said this before, she couldn't wear pants. Because she had been taught her whole life that women were not supposed to wear men's clothing. And do you know that if she would have, it would have affected her conscience. Now your conscience, a lot of people don't understand what conscience means. Conscience is how you see yourself in your relationship to God concerning divine things. Now there are some people, I know a young lady and she's absolutely beautiful and she has the prettiest hair that I think I've ever seen. And, uh, and, and, and in her church, where she goes to church, they're taught that it's wrong to cut your hair. Now, she can go have her hair trimmed now, what's the difference between trimming and cutting? I don't really know. But if you cut them dead ends off, now see, I'm not, I'm not picking. But what I'm saying is, when it comes to scruples of conscience, you know, we have to be very careful not to wound people's conscience. Paul said, I can't tell you certain things because you're not able to bear it. There are certain things that I don't tell people. I don't try to talk people out of their convictions or what they've been taught that's right or wrong. The only thing I can do is teach the truth and let God deal with their consciences. Because many times people actually need, the Bible says that their faith is weak. They're not totally dependent upon 
their faith in him. But God does not despise that person. You know, it says, let, not, let, let him that doesn't eat certain things, let, don't let him judge the person that does. And don't let the person that's strong in faith <laughs> despise. See what I'm talking about? Despise. Think less of, less valuable if the person's weak in faith. They may need a little help in their faith. You know what I'm saying? There were certain people that came out. If you read the book of Romans in the 14th and 15th chapter, I don't know why I'm saying all this, but I felt prompted to say it. In the 14th, 15th chapter of the book of Romans, Paul realized that there were certain people coming out of Judaism that were being saved, and they were taught that it was ceremonially unclean to eat certain things. But Paul also knew that it takes time to retrain somebody's conscience to where they understand that their relationship to God is not based on certain ceremonial things that are clean or unclean, long sleeves, women's dresses, what you eat, what you don't eat. You know, we don't place emphasis on that in our teaching. But there are certain people that whose consciences have to be retrained. I remember that Sister Francis went from wearing, do you remember this, Ellen? You remember what I'm talking about? She went from wearing pant, uh, dresses to kulaks. How many know what kulaks is? I thought they were cool looking myself. But that, that's been a long time ago. Long, long time ago. And then to dresses. And then to dress women's dress slacks. I mean, I wouldn't look too good in a pair of women's dress slacks. You know what I'm saying? That'd be women's wear me. I, I wouldn't wear that. You know what I'm saying? So we, we, we need to be careful in our dealing with people. Because God is concerned about the person. You know, God, so we need, to, we need to guard one another's faith. When Paul talks about offending people, he's not talking about making people mad, though that could be part of it. But when Paul talks about offending someone, he's talking about injuring their faith. Don't injure their faith. You know, we, we should do nothing. Nothing that would uh, cause somebody's faith to be weakened, for them to be discouraged and disappointed. Paul said, who is offended and I don't burn? In other words, it affects me. It, it, it affects me greatly when somebody's offended, when somebody is hurt, their faith is hurt. We don't need to hurt anybody's faith. So we need to be careful in, in, in our life, guarding our lives and, and placing people that are valuable. I remember when I was, this has been years, decades ago, and, uh, you know, I, I, I would say things like, well, you know, uh, they're just going to have to get over it because, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this or do that, and, it, uh, and it, it, if they're offended, you know, and it was very uncharitable attitude toward people. You know, if I know that somebody is offended by something, then I'm not going to do that. Not while I'm around them. Now, if, they, if they're offended at me eating a ribeye steak, then I'm going to wait till they're not around and eat my ribeye steak. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, it, it says that we're not supposed to be, uh, uh, why should I let my faith be judged by somebody else's conscience? But see, when you're, when you're not living for yourself, when you're living for others, we should no longer live it to ourselves, the Bible says. So we're supposed to walk charitably. We're supposed to walk in love. Putting the other person first. That's what the Bible teaches. You know. So I don't know why I said all that. But, you know, it's very important. Uh, I, was, I was speaking to someone the other day. And, uh, you know, I can always locate people by what they say. That's why it's very important to listen to people. To take the time to not always be doing all the talking. You know, the Bible says, be swift to hear and slow to speak. And weigh what's being said by that person. Now, I wasn't judging this person. I wasn't criticizing this person. But I was just listening to what they were saying so that I could see where they were at in spiritual, uh, spiritual condition. Where they were at as far as like 
maturity in Christ and how much they knew and how long they've been walking with the Lord. And, you know, being very careful what I said. You know, sometimes you have to feed people with an eyedropper instead of with a bottle. Some, sometimes they can't bear very much, especially when we're dealing with people that are very, very young in the Lord. Very babes in Christ. That we have to feed them with milk. Things that are already digested. Things that maybe you've experienced and you went through. And then you can relay your experience along with the truth of God's word. As long as you convey it in love. And gentleness. And not be judgmental or critical. You know of that person who may be having struggles in their life. But you know, babies have struggles. Did you know that? Babies have trouble crawling to begin with, even rolling over. And then they have trouble uh, walking. They start pulling themselves up on furniture and then fall down, hit their head. And, you know, we take care of people that are, are weak, that are, are, are immature, you know, that haven't grown up in the Lord. You know, so we have to be very careful in our attitude. The Lord is very, very... Uh, He's very, very concerned about the way we treat one another in the body, in the body of Christ. You know, and not to be critical of a person that if they've started walking with God and they make some mistakes, that we don't, that we're not critical of them because we're not the judge. He, there's one lawgiver and judge. That's what the scripture said in the previous chapter, isn't it? Who's able to save and destroy. You know, and, and the scripture, even when it's talking about people that are weak, that we consider weak, that, uh, you know, the Bible says they shall be holding up. God's going to hold those people up. He's going to strengthen them. You know, the, the Bible says there's not many wise, not many noble, you know, not many strong. You know, what we, what the world would consider, you know, man, there's something else, man. Oh, they're a champion boxer or they're a movie star or they're a philosopher or whatever they are. God doesn't place it. He said God has chosen the weak things. In the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise, the things that are not. And that has reference to the slaves in the Roman Empire who had no standing, no citizenship whatsoever at all. And God said, I've chosen them. Why? So that no one can glory in his presence. No one can tell. How many of you, in, I, you know, when I, heard, when I heard that teaching about the, the weak things and the foolish things and the things that are not, and I thought about me meeting that category. I'm the one. I, I, I'm not wise. I'm not strong. You know, I'm not famous. I'm not noble. You know, I, I, I meet the criteria. So God has chosen me. You know, so it's very important that we don't be critical, that we embrace people that we and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on in the chapter. I don't know exactly where uh, Brother Mark ended. I think he said verse 13. Was it verse 13, brother? Or was it a little bit further up? I, I studied the whole chapter. So verse 11. OK. Okay, let's start with uh, verse 10. It says, Take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. How many of you have ever suffered? Nobody? Everybody? <laughs> you know, the, um, the idea that you're not going to suffer pain or disappointment or persecution. I mean, that's an unreal expectation. If you think you're just going to walk with God and everything's going to be rosy and everything's going to go great, you know, that you're not going to suffer any opposition or setbacks, you know, that you're, you're living in a fantasy. Yep. Right. You're living in a fantasy. You know, I remember the first time I, I, I tried to start a business. <clears throat> Man, I was so shocked and disappointed that people were so dirty and underhanded 
and low down and dishonest. I was so shocked that, that hardly anybody had my best interest at heart. I was totally, I mean, I went into that with such unreal expectations that it was a fantasy and I, I, it eventually folded. I, thank God I didn't go into debt. Thank God I just, I just let the person that I got the business from have it back. But it was a very, very painful, painful experience to go into business like that and to expect everybody to be like you are, but they're not. I'm sure... <laughs> I'm sure everybody or anybody that's in business, you know, you, or even people that are employed are, are totally, you know, disappointed, you know, if you have unreal expectations. But when you understand that, you know, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a, an understanding that there's both pain and pleasure, you know, there's success. And then, you know, there's disappointment in, in the Christian life. You know, you're, you, you, you take God's word and God's principles and you have an experience with God. You experience the goodness of God and the love of God. And then you go out into the world. And Jesus said, you know, you're going to suffer persecution. You're, you're going to have setbacks. You know, you're, you're going to have disappointments. You're going to have tribulation. You know, and he's talking about the prophets here. I mean, back in these days, guys, they didn't just kill the, the message. They killed the messenger. You know, and a lot of times, you know, you yeah, that's right. They killed the messenger too, buddy. How many of you ever heard that term? Don't, don't kill the messenger. If you don't like the message, don't kill the messenger. You know, but... You know, whenever you, whenever you come into this walk and you expect it not to be any opposition, and, and then when it happens, you know, people are just shocked. You know, you, you obey God, you, you do what God said to do, and then, you know, everything doesn't work out like peaches and cream. It's so true. Kind of like marriage. You know, you enter into marriage with a fantasy idea. But most marriages don't end in fantasy. It's reality that you're dealing with another person and their will and their desires and their personality and their likes and their dislikes. I think you need to take a real look. You know, if you plan on spending the rest of your life with somebody... You know, the, the, over, uh, there's one church that I really, I, I love this church. It's uh, out in California. <coughs> Excuse me. But they have, a, they have a, a, a test that you take before they let you get. Before they will marry you, they give you a test. Personality capa uh, compatibilities. You know, the, 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 uh, the economic uh, area you came from compared to your wife and your husband. You know, and, and, and people enter in, that's why people enter into marriage in, in, with romance in mind and with love and all these, these high ideas, and then they face the wind. You know, I think about Jesus, I, I think about him, and, and I know he hears from the Father because he says, I only do the things I, I, I see my Father do. I only hear, I only say the things I hear my Father say. And Jesus walks up to the edge of the lake. And he said, let us pass over to the other side. Now, man, if Jesus said we're going over to the other side, surely it's going to be smooth sailing, man. The sun's going to be shining. The dolphins are going to be jumping out in front of our boat, man. And it's just going to be wonderful. And what happens? There's a storm of wind. It's, it's a supernatural storm. It's not just a natural storm. It's supernatural. It comes from the enemy. And he tries to stop the plan of God. He tries to stop Jesus from getting to the other side because that guy over there on the other side has a legion of demons inside of him. And the enemy knows that if Jesus goes over there, it's not going to be good. There's going to be two kingdoms that clash. 
and he knows he's going to lose. It's the same way with you and I, you know. When, we, when we're obeying God, when we're walking with God, you can expect opposition. You can expect things to come against you to try to stop the purposes and plans of God in your life. And to me, I mean, it's a, a, a total mystery when you're going through it. You know, it's very trying. That's why they call it a trial. It's very trying on your, on, your, on your emotions, you know, and your understanding, trying to figure it out with your head. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure Job, it talks about Job here. Let's read on down a little bit. It says, uh, be patient. No, that's, 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 that's the verse before. Behold, we count them happy, which what? Endure. I, I asked somebody the other day, because I'm going through something in my life right now. And it's not easy. I mean, it's hard. And you know, the Bible said, He that will love life and see good days. And I asked this person, who's a very good friend of mine. I said, Sometimes I wonder if there's going to be good days. Yep. Yep. Love life. And say, How many of you ever loved life? How many of you ever had that gusto moment? Uh -oh. How many of you ever had that gusto moment in your life? Man. Everything's going great. I'll never forget. I had everything I owned paid for. Everything. I had a nice home. I had a business. I mean, it, it, everything was great. I was laying there on the couch watching the Discovery Channel. One of my favorite uh, episodes was on. And I was laying on that nice, comfortable couch. And my kids were there, you know. I had all my kids with me. And, I mean, it was just great. And I looked up, and I looked up at my wife, then my wife. And I said, man, isn't this great? Everything we have is paid for. We're debt free. We've got a business. We've got money in the bank. I, I'm just so happy. And when someone looks at you and says, I'm glad you are. And you know what I thought? Oh, brother. Here we go. Here we go. The enemy is going to come and try to mess up your playhouse. Don't think, you know, Brother Swagger says you're either coming out of a trial or going into one. Somebody told me the other day, I had never really thought about it before in my life. They said, you know, you married a woman that had a special child. Her name was Megan. And she had Down syndrome. She wasn't expected to live. She wasn't supposed to walk. She wasn't supposed to talk. And I never forget when they brought her home from the hospital, they, they sent her home to die. And I, I was on my face in the church at Faith Living Work Fellowship, and I was holding her tiny little feet. And the presence of God came on me, and I interceded and groaned and travailed for that child. And I, when I left church that day, I said, God joined my spirit to that child today. Well, I ended up raising that baby. Ended up raising her. And I spent 12 and a half years with her. And uh, then she died in 2003 on November the 10th. And uh, then I had to take care of a friend of mine who was old and, and he got to where he couldn't take care of himself. And, and I had to take care of him. And then now I'm having to take care of my mom. And uh, I, they, the person reminded me about that. I said, Dad, don't you realize you've taken care of Megan and you've taken care of uh, Jimmy Smith and, 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 and now you're taking care of your mom. And you know, I got to thinking about it. I was like, you know, I really haven't really thought about that before. I've spent about uh, half of my life taking care of people. You know, special needs people. But I never considered it a trial, especially raising my girl and taking care of my friend, until I had to start taking care of my mom. 
You know, it's one thing to take care of somebody and deal with somebody that is that is all there mentally. Or if Megan was there, she was smart enough, she knew what she was doing. She was sharp. I mean, she may have been handicapped in some senses, but she she was she was a pleasure for me to be around. But when a, when a, when you when you face unpleasant circumstances, and God has placed you in unpleasant places where you're having to deal with things that are unpleasant and they don't cater to your emotions and to your pleasure points. You know, it can be a challenge. And then you ask yourself, will there be good days? Love life and see good days. What are you going to do? You're going to endure. You're going to endure. You're going to remain the same. You know, you're not going to throw in the towel. You're not going to quit doing what's right. I had a guy come up to me one time on my front porch, and I was sitting out there in front of the locker plant out there when I used to own a home right on the highway. And I was sitting out on the front porch, and he had he had uh, been so mean to his wife that she left him. And he came up on that porch and was wanting to justify himself and wanting to prove himself right. And he was ang I could tell he was angry. And I told that person, I said, I don't care what that person has done. And I knew most of it was his fault, but I never said that. But I told him, I said, no matter what takes place, you do what's right. You walk in love. What they're doing has nothing to do with you. Because what's most important is this. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you keep this right, it's going to make this right. Now, I'm not saying that person is going to come back into your life. You, you have no, no control over that. They have a will of their own. But the main thing is keeping it right here. Enduring. Remaining the same in every circumstance. Being patient. Believing in the goodness of God. The wisdom of God. The power of God. The devil wants to steal our joy. And because, you know, that's where, that's one of our foundations in Christ. Is to be able to live in peace no matter what's going on around us. And if he can, then we'll end up being a tool for for him to steal others' joy because we're not handling right what what ministry opportunities are given to us from the Lord. So if we look at it in that aspect as you know ministry opportunities for God to bless, because most of the time that we we don't, it's because we're seeing how how it makes us feel as opposed to well, what's God want me to do about this? And you know, it's not we don't take things personally, but see it as it is. It's, you know, monkey wrenches that the devil's put there to steal our joy and to take our peace and, and to use us as a tool to do that to somebody else. Yeah, yeah that's true. We, we don't need to let the devil steal our joy or our peace in any circumstance. Because that, that's his aim, is to steal your faith. And if he steals your faith, he's got your joy and he's got your peace. If he can break that, you know, I, I, I know what it's like to, to suffer loss. You know, loss, especially in relationships, if you, if, you, if you have a broken relationship, there's a great sense of loss that comes with it. You know, especially if you come out of a, a good relationship, for the most part. You suffer loss. But you know, the Bible says that we are to take joyfully the spoiling of our goods. Why? Because we have a more enduring substance. That fades not away. See, that, that's, that you have to keep your perspective right if you're going through trouble and suffering. There will be good days. That's right. There will be good days. The sun will shine again. I mean, and you may go through a time in your life like Job to where... It's so horrendous and so, so much suffering.
that the Lord will say, that's it. No more for you. You've, you know, you've been proven. Because a lot of times when we go through things in our life, it's so that we'll know where we're at. Where am I at? What is it? I'm located now. The testing and the trying is so that you can see where you are. So that you can see that you need to grow. That he's, what he's working in you is much more important than what he might deliver you from or bring you through. Because Job said, when he brings me forth, I shall be as silver and I shall be as gold. Because he's working in you. He's making you like his son, conforming you to his image. You know, we count them happy that endure. Once you pass through a trial, the lesson is learned. And there's a reward that comes through enduring. There's a place of, of happiness. And there's a place that that overcoming. I know. You know, I've walked through some overcoming situations in my life. You know? And then you can minister to others. Let's read on that. <clears throat> it says, We count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that he is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That's what was revealed in the book of Job. You know? How, how merciful and how good the Lord is. That's what's revealed in the book of Job. That's the main thing is the goodness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. You know, a lot of people try to figure out, well, you know, I used to hear this in the Word of Faith camp all the time. Well, if Job would have done this, and if Job wouldn't have done that, and if he wouldn't have said this and wouldn't have said that, then he wouldn't have had to go through that suffering. That's not true. You keep all your words just right. You, you know, the Lord said he's perfect and right. Didn't he? I mean, we know he was justified by faith. And that's why the Lord can say he's perfect and upright. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the devil that asked Job, asked God about Job. It was God that pointed Job out to the devil. Isn't that? That's right. Sure enough. And, and Job got a revelation of the tender mercies and love of God through the whole situation. Even though he suffered loss. But, he, but God brought him through. God delivered him. Through that, through that terrible situation. And not only did he deliver him, he restored him. And not only did he restore him, he gave him more than what he had before. But, but Job did suffer loss. And Job was a human being just like you and I. If you read the book of Job, you'll see. He got pretty down. I'm telling you, if you go from up here, you know, my daddy always used to tell me, it's easy to go up, son, hard to come down. That's true. So you know, you, you know, there were questions and, 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 and he was examining himself and, you know, everything that he went through. But God was revealing who he was. You know, I've had God deliver me before through a, through a terrible, terrible trial. It lasted for years. You know, I, I kept going to church. I kept... Praying, I kept reading my Bible. You know, I kept living life. But all the time, people never knew what was going on on the inside of me. They never knew the struggles that I had at night. Sister Carolyn knows what I'm talking about. When you face the enemy of your soul in accusation after accusation after accusation, Brother Roger, if you'd have just known this, you, I understand that, but I didn't know that. And nobody else knew that either, of what I was going through. But it took God to divinely deliver me. And after I got through with it, I was like, Phew. now I don't have to face that anymore. You know? 
I'm telling you, God can reveal himself, and I found out how, love, how loving and merciful and kind the Lord was and is. He was revealing himself to me. But I had to walk through some tough times. Tough times. This next verse, I haven't got for a couple of minutes. I'm not going to get into this, y'all. I'm not going to get into that. Above all, swearing. I'm going to stop right there, guys. I ain't got but about two minutes left. I appreciate your attention. I hope, hope God ministered to you this morning.